grace and peace in Christ Jesus. Amen. The text is from the Gospel lesson, verses 48 and 49. Now the betrayer had given him a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. There ends the text. Your fellow redeemed, there may be no inner pain or psychological distress more severe than being deceived by someone in whom you had put your confidence. It can destroy a person to think that the love they thought was real was a lie all along. We've all felt that in various degrees, and if you haven't, you will someday. It can absolutely rip your heart out and make you feel like you just want to die to end the pain. By nature, we want to trust other people. We want to believe in their love for us. It gives us a sense of worth to know that there is somebody out there who cares about us and, and trusts us. And when that's betrayed, then our entire sense of self-worth is thrown into question. Maybe we don't inspire trust in others. Maybe there's something wrong with us that made them stop caring about us. Betrayal can ruin us. And betrayal can ruin our relationships with other people, too. How can you ever trust somebody else who says they love you when the last person who said they loved you was lying? And we often talk about how Jesus came into this world to identify with our human condition. He assumes our place, the place of a weak sinner before God the Father. And that assuming our place and identifying with us is true even at the point of betrayal. Jesus is betrayed by Judas. That further cements that he truly is one with us in the worst pains of this life. The one thing that rips our heart out worse than anything else is the thing Jesus takes into himself. How Jesus reacts to that betrayal also says a great deal about him. Judas just ate the Passover with Christ just a few hours before this betrayal. And the Passover is considered the closest, most personal meal that the Jews could possibly eat together. And it's usually eaten only by families together. Jesus eating with his 12 disciples in that upper room was a statement that they were a family. And in Matthew's Gospel, it tells us specifically how Judas was numbered among the 12. He was considered part of that deep personal relationship and family with Jesus. When family betrays you, the hurt is even worse than if it was just a friend. But Jesus doesn't curse him, doesn't condemn him, doesn't in fact say anything negative to him at all. In fact, when Judas comes out and betrays Jesus, Jesus calls him friend. And that's not just empty words. Jesus meant it. He wanted Judas to be a friend. He wanted him to be numbered among the twelve. Jesus had handpicked Judas after all, entrusted him with the treasury. When Judas went to hell, and Scripture does tell us he went to hell, it was not a matter of Jesus getting back at him because he had betrayed Christ. The reason was that Judas simply could not accept that Jesus' grace could cover even a sin of betrayal like his. Now what happens in the garden that our gospel lesson tells us about where Judas betrays Christ with a kiss doesn't hurt anyone as badly as what it hurts Judas himself. After he did what he did, he returned to the priests in the temple and he tried to give the money back. Suddenly that money wasn't quite enough to soothe his guilty conscience. He knew what he had done. And he hated himself for it. Judas could not imagine that God would ever forgive him for this. But Jesus would have. Jesus wanted to. The magnitude of Christ's forgiveness could have covered even a betrayal like that of Judas. 
hidden behind a kiss. Now, lest we just puff ourselves up and focus on the failings of one man, we should consider that the whole betrayal thing is a universal sin. And it's in us, too. We all claim to be part of Christ's holy family. We eat at his table up here regularly. We call him our Savior, our brother. Though we claim this close communion with Christ, you know for yourself as well as I that we all still turn on him at times. In those moments when nobody else is around to hear or watch or maybe when we're in the close company of trusted friends, we betray Christ with our words, our feelings, the things we say about other people. And our sins are no less hurtful to him than the betrayal of Judas in the garden. But Jesus does not abandon us. He keeps right on loving us. He keeps right on treating us as if we are his family. And he forgives our betrayals over and over again. There are times where either consciously or unconsciously, we try to balance the scales of our sins by beating ourselves up. Something inside us figures that, yes, we, we have offended God this much, and so now we need to loathe ourselves that much in order to counteract it. That's what Judas got messed up with. He came to the decision that the only way he could balance the scales after what he had done was to hate himself so much that he would commit suicide, which he did. We learn from his example that balancing the scales is not possible. We can't hate ourselves enough, and we can't punish ourselves enough to make up for our betrayals of Christ. Nor do we have to. The point of Jesus suffering his betrayal and the mocking that followed and his eventual crucifixion was to bear the shame that we deserve to bear. He was hated for us. He got what we deserve. So the scales are balanced because he balanced them in, his, in himself. And that means as far as what we're concerned on a daily basis, we can go through life without having to beat ourselves up. We can, we should let go of our past sins, not carry around the guilt and the shame. We can't go back and undo them, but Christ can. And he has. Our sins are gone in the sight of God. It's as if they never even existed. So we can go forward through life not feeling guilty at all. And that's perfectly okay. Because that means we trust in Christ to have carried our guilt for us. Judas' betrayal shows what happens when we don't let go of sins. When you look at the other people around Jesus and in the New Testament, you see that so many of them had these horrible skeletons in their closet, and yet they didn't walk around and beating themselves up for what they had done. They let go. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. She did horrible things with other men. But we never see an image of her in the New Testament as somebody who was moping around all the time because of the awful things she did. She let go of her sins. They were forgiven by Christ. They were dead to God. She went forward as a new person. Or St. Paul, for that matter, having been complicit in the murder of people, having persecuted Christians, he doesn't go around punishing himself for that. He sees that Christ bore the punishment for him. He lived as if he were a new creation, because he was. Or Matthew, a guy who collected taxes for the Roman government and betrayed his own people. We never hear a peep from him about how awful he was. He let go of his sin. He let Christ cleanse him. Every one of these people around Jesus had something in their past they could have hated themselves for. And they all learned to let go and to live their lives as if those sins did not exist because in the eyes of Christ, they did not exist. Jesus put them away. As they lived, we can live. We are pardoned and we are
as fully as what each of them were. We can go forward in life as if there are no sins in our past. We can turn all of that baggage we carry around over to Christ knowing he has carried it for us to his cross and it's gone and it's done and we are new creations. Perhaps then we all have been complicit in Judas' betrayal. But here, now, tonight, and whenever we gather here, Jesus speaks his forgiveness over us. And all that betrayal disappears. So thanks be to Jesus for suffering betrayal. And yet for continuing to be forgiving and merciful to people like us. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.